distinguished speaker and the distinguished lecturer. Um, it's a special pleasure for me to introduce Professor Patrick Ray. And the reason is I know Patrick for 28 years. He looks like a young man. Uh, you have to go very far. I actually remember very well this moment when I first met. It was in Stanford. And it's indeed was almost 20 years ago. Oh, since I had a wonderful academic career after this meeting, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, uh, and, uh, Patrick really did uh, so many wonderful contributions in the area of industrial, industrial organization, industrial economics, and really impacted the discipline in many ways. You know, if you come to, and I live in Brussels, you know, come to Brussels and you talk to people about the economics of regulation, or regulation, they immediately say, Patrick Ray is the Mr. Revelation in Europe and everywhere, and, and really the impact that he made on the discipline is tremendous. Moreover, it's not only obviously the regulation, but the fact that the Toulouse School of Economics is one of the leading centers in the world industrial organizations, a large degree, Patrick, some other members of the institution. So, well, these are there's so many distinctions I don't want to go over all that. He's the president of the European Association for Research in Industrial Economics, served on the board of leading journals, and many, many other things. And so we're very happy to have Patrick here. Now let me just also mention that the presentation will be in English. Now we talk about him speaking in Russian, but he doesn't speak Russian, even though his wife, Marie Pierre, it just speaks impeccable, impeccable, impeccable Russian. But to tell you the truth, it's a, Patrick has been in Moscow many times, but it's the first time he comes as a scholar, you not know, as a spouse of the other scholar. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a distinguished business for him, for us, and we are delighted to have him. Thank you, Patrick, for coming. Thank you very much, Shubu. It's a, it's a real pleasure to work. Eventually, you know, <laughs> being there at the school, I did. Uh, this, um, I, I also, I was expecting Shomo to be uh, completely partial, and of course, you did not, did not disappoint me, and you know, it was way too kind in this uh, introduction. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, it is really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'll, uh, I will present uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some overview of uh, some recent work that I've been uh, interested in um, uh, the, during the, the last, um, uh, last decade. Uh, actually, when we met with uh, uh, Shuro, it was, uh, uh, I was a, a young kid uh, <laughs> this time. Uh, he was kind enough to, to, to spend some time with, with, with me. Um, the, and it, I was uh, excited about a paper I had been uh, working on with uh, Jean Tirol on the, the, the economics of vertical restraints, and uh, I had been interested there. Uh, this, uh, this is the, the summer where I, 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 um, I met with uh, Joe Stiglitz, and then we did a couple of works on vertical restraints on there because I was excited by the topic. And then I, I left that topic for, uh, for quite a few years, but uh, as it turns out, recently uh, I, I moved back there for here is uh, uh, back to uh, back to the future, you know, but, um, back to vertical restaurants, uh, and I would like to, to share with you some uh, some of the work that I've, I've been uh, doing uh, uh, recently. So this is the uh, joint work. Uh, this is based on joint work essentially with uh, uh, Thibaut Verger, uh, Janine Niklos Tal, um, one of my uh, former uh, PhD students who betrayed me because uh, she, when she was a student uh, with the name of Tal and I thought, you know, I had selected her on this basis so that I would make sure that her name would appear in the author and then she married and became me blush. Then, uh, and uh, more recently I've been uh, working again with Thibault uh, and uh, as well as uh, with Mike Winston and uh, Volker Nocke on uh, so some, of those, uh, some of the issues that I've been, I've been present here. Um, so this the, 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 the roadmap for the, the motivation for, for this uh, body of work was uh, the, the observation that uh, we are still uh, in a want you know, in, you know, still lacking uh, a, a nice um, plausible and yet convenient practical framework for the analysis of uh, vertical relations in a setup in which 
uh, it is not predetermined who deals with what, with whom, and it is not the case that uh, it is the case that in principle anyone could, like if he chooses, uh, chooses to, anyone, any uh, actor, any player uh, could interact with any player on the other on the other level. Um, if you look at the literature on vertical restraints. Uh, the paper with Jean that I was mentioning uh, would be a good example of uh, 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 what constitutes uh, probably 80% of the literature, which is uh, focusing on purely vertical issues. So you, you freeze the environment, you focus on one, let's say, one manufacturer dealing with uh, a retailer or a retail network, and you focus on the vertical coordination issues between that manufacturer and its retailers. And so this would apply to situations of a, a monopoly, uh, monopolistic supplier. Uh, you could extend it to the case where there are multiple, uh, there are rival manufacturers and possibly other retailers as well, but you take their uh, behavior as a given and you focus on the residual demand for the firms which are on the, on the spot line. And you focus on exclusively on the vertical coordination issues between those uh, those two levels. So that's that's 80 percent of the literature on vertical investments. Um, then, when it comes to extending you know, to looking at the impact of those vertical relations on the strategic interaction between rival vertical structures, they say, or rival uh, brands or rival retail networks at either level, um, you have let's say, you know, 15 percent of the literature which has trying to look at this and it focuses on rival vertical structures, i.e. you have um, Benetton dealing with Benetton franchises um, and you will have Rodier dealing with Rodier franchises or you can have uh, BMW and BMW car dealers and, uh, versus Audi and Audi car dealers. Um, or McDonald's versus Burger King. You know, the, this kind of uh, situation where the, the retailers or the, the, the downstream players are monobrand uh, players. You, know, the, uh, you go to the uh, BMW dealer and you find BMWs, you will not find the Renault uh, cars in a BMW dealer. Um, that, so this, this is the kind of situation that has been analyzed. So you have independent, you know, separate vertical structures that are competing against each other. What you don't have is the situation or you have very few uh, pieces, very few papers on the kind of situations where um, you, know, the, you will find the Pepsi and Coke. You can buy both Pepsi and Coke at uh, Carrefour and an Auchan to take two French, uh, two French uh, uh, large retailers. So for most consumer goods, you can find rival brands in the same competing uh, stores. So it's, uh, this is the kind of situation which I like to see here, where you, you will have Pepsi here, you will have the Coke there, you will have Auchan here, you will have the Carrefour there, and you find both brands at both stores. Uh, this is what I will refer to as a situation of interlocking relationship for the, if you have any better suggestion for the work I've, I've been struggling with it for quite a few years now. Um, so this, this is the kind of situation that we would like to analyze a bit more than it has been done. And we would also endogenize uh, you know, the, the choice between this kind of situation versus the franchise network uh, situation with you know, different uh, car dealers dealing with each one, each one dealing with only one one. one. So that's the, this is the, this is the, the agenda. You know, trying to have some uh, sort of tractable framework for dealing with this. Two, two types of questions, you know, I mean, uh, the various questions that, that arise. One natural question is, what kind of outcome would you uh, expect from this? Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have com you have rival brands, rival uh, retailers. Uh, that being said, they have all the incentives in the world to you know, have the cozy interaction as cozy uh, interaction as possible. So one possible you know, outcome or one possible uh, uh, way in which the industry may try to structure itself is to ensure that there is as little competition, effective competition as possible, so that you know, we share you know, whatever uh, pie uh, you know, we can uh, generate. So that's one thing. Another uh, type of uh, uh, situation would be the one where one uh, player may, take to, may try to get rid 
of the rival, so that's another way of eliminating competition instead of cooperating with the rivals, you try to get rid of them and get the, the whole pie. Hmm? So they, these are the kind of uh, a question that uh, we'll be interested in, we'll, what, when is it more likely that we'll get cooperation type of outcome or, uh, or foreclosure, monopolization type of outcome, or when we, we get competition, or as uh, you know, consumers may, uh, may uh, be you know, wish. Uh, a related um, aspect is, what is the impact on this, uh, the, on the likely outcome of the kind of vertical arrangements that take place? You know, why can are the firms relying on a simple are the wholesale contracts simple linear wholesale price? You no, know, here's my price. You can buy whatever you know how much you want at that price. That would be just, you know in the Arrow de Breu, you know, type of world. You know, for each good there is a market. On this market there is a linear price, and at this price you can buy, you can trade whatever you want. Uh, in in the case of vertical interaction with, between uh, you know uh, industry players. Uh, typically, the, the contracts you find are a bit more sophisticated, more complex than a simple linear contract. Uh, you can have non-linear tariffs. Uh, the simplest form of a non-linear tariff would be a two-part tariff, where you have this wholesale price, but also you have some kind of fixed fee, which can go one way or another, by the way. There was a big debate in, uh, uh, in France, but you know, in many other countries as well, uh, a few years ago, about the, the so-called slotting allowances, or, you know, fees, payments that go the, the wrong way, uh, where the manufacturers would pay the retailers for carrying and uh, uh, delivering the, uh, their, their products. Uh, so it's the manufacturers that pay the retailers, uh, even though the retailers are taking the stuff from the manufacturers in order to sell to the consumers. So there was a, a bit of concern in what was rational for this and what, kind of, uh, what would be the effect on the competition. Uh, one of the concerns, for example, was that in this way, large manufacturers could try to buy, uh, you know, to buy uh, the, 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 retail, uh, the retailers into, you know, exclusive relation and, you know, what is, and excluding in this way uh, rival uh, brands from being uh, distributed in the, uh, you know, from having access to, to consumers. You can have uh, uh, contracts that are exclusive or non-exclusive. Uh, of course, you can have, uh, and I'll make a point on this uh, later, you can have uh, ex uh, explicit exclusivity or you can, uh, may also have de facto exclusivity. If you offer um, uh, a large uh, <coughs> two-part tariff with a large uh, you know, fixed fee, then it is uh, uh, unlikely that the, uh, the, 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 the retailer who accepts to pay you this fixed fee will also carry lots of high value brand because in that case, it will sell fewer of your own brands. So the, by insisting on large uh, fixed payments, uh, it's also a, a, more, a slightly more subtle way to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, de facto exclusivity. So that we want to uh, have a, a better idea of uh, the interaction, the interplay, you know, the impact of the type of vertical uh, arrangements on the likely outcome on the, on the market. Now, I'm going to uh, uh, organize the, uh, the, the presentation into two parts. The first part will uh, be devoted to the simple uh, uh, case where there was only one player at one or the other level, you know, either at the absolute level or the absolute level. But, you know, take this uh, as a warm-up exercise. You know, what do we know uh, from this? Keeping in mind that uh, the uh, objective is really to look at this kind of uh, situation where you have rivalry at both uh, levels. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, it maybe useful to start with those kind of uh, simpler relations where you have a single player either downstream or upstream. Um, and with this is, in particular, this will be useful to get some uh, uh, more, uh, more intuition about you know, whether we are likely to see cooperation or uh, foreclosure at the level where uh, there is more than one player. This, uh, uh, by the way, the, the, I will, the, in order for, the, for this discussion, I will distinguish uh, the, whether you have a, a, a competition or not you know, at one level. That's one thing. Uh, uh, I will distinguish this aspect from where, where the bargaining lies in the vertical structure, whether the bargaining in a given bilateral vertical uh, relation, whether the bargaining lies downstream or upstream. So, for example, you, you can think of uh, the retailer uh, being, you know, the 
picture on, on this uh, on the left here, where you have a single return. It may be the case that you, in some uh, you know, small town, uh, you only have one car dealer in town. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, this car dealer is going to have a lot of bargaining power when dealing with the, the car manufacturer. So you may have a situation where, you know, for the purpose of the analysis, there is a local uh, market, uh, local monopoly power in some uh, uh, local market, but the bargaining power between the downstream player and the upstream player may lie on the other side. Uh, and, uh, and likewise, you, know, you may have a, 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 a small produ producer um, that uh, has uh, some kind of uh, niche or deal is dealing with both Carrefour and Auchan. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the relation, the bargaining power will lie on the on the on the, on the side of the, uh, the, the niche uh, producer. So, the, also, uh, for, it may be uh, useful to clarify what I mean by downstream and upstream. Uh, throughout my uh, uh, the, the, the presentation, uh, the, the upstream versus downstream is defined as uh, with respect to who is the closest in terms of strategic interaction with the final consumer. So, the, in the example of manufacturers and retailers, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, Benetton is a manufacturer. This is not true, actually. It's more producer than manufacturer. Uh, it has subcontractors that do actually the actual manufacturing. Um, but, and then the, the, the Benetton outlets would be downstream. The Benetton uh, has the franchise. The franchisor will be upstream. Um, when it comes to private labels, however, the situation is already a bit less clear because uh, most of the large retail chains have developed their own brands, uh, private labels, and so they play the role, they are both in the retailer, but also they are co competing with uh, some of the uh, national brand uh, producers. And, uh, it, but uh, to give you an example of uh, uh, you know, why I insist on this, uh, what do I mean by upstream versus downstream? Let me take the example of the, the U, uh, U.S. Uh, gas reform, where um, the, so one, one of the issues in, uh, in, uh, in gas, uh, it's the same in uh, oil markets and so on. One of the issues, uh, well, as a customer, if you, you know, if you if you need oil or gas, you need two things: you need uh, uh, the, the staff and you need a, well, so you need a supplier, but also you need a way to uh, carry. Uh, the, the staff uh, from the, between the supplier and your, uh, and your facilities, your plants and so on. Um, before the reform, the, uh, so, and there were two, uh, therefore you need to, to interact with two types of uh, players. Uh, whoever is, uh, controls the pipelines, the transportation infrastructure, and the suppliers. Uh, typically, you have a natural uh, 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 monopoly situations or you know, large economies of uh, uh, scale at the transportation level, so typically you don't have much of a choice. So the, this is a, a, a segment that is typically uh, monopolized, at least locally. Um, the, you may have some competition on the, on the supply side. Before the, competition, before the, the reform in the US, uh, the way the, uh, the, the business was organized is an industrial customer like uh, you know, electricity uh, power plant uh, who needed uh, uh, gas, uh, the, 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 customer, the industrial customer would turn to uh, the pipeline owner uh, and would uh, strike a deal, would negotiate a deal with the pipeline owner. And then the pipeline owner would interact with the potential suppliers uh, to, supply, to, uh, to supply the gas. So the situation would be one in which the industrial customers would be dealing with the monopolized segment, the pipeline owner, and then the pipeline owner would be dealing uh, with the uh, gas suppliers. So the, in that pre-reform uh, situation, the gas suppliers would be upstream, uh, the pipeline owner would be downstream, according to my definition. You know, the pipeline owner was closer, was at the direct interface with the customer. Uh, Post-reform, the, uh, the, the, this was changed. Uh, the uh, industrial customers would negotiate directly with, with the gas suppliers, and whoever were, uh, wins the competition for the supply of a given you know, uh, customer would then have to turn and strike a deal, negotiate a deal with the pipeline owner. So, post reform, we move 
uh, from this situation on the left to the situation that is on the right. In the sense that industrial customers would be dealing with a more competitive segment directly with the gas suppliers, and then the gas suppliers would have to deal uh, with the, with the uh, pipeline owners. So, who is upstream and who is downstream? To some extent, can be endogenous in some uh, in some instances. So what I what I will mean from now on is, from a strategic standpoint, uh, downstream means that the direct interface with customers. Upstream means you know why they they are up the line. So the upstream firms are dealing with the downstream firms. The downstream firms are dealing with the industrial customers. The upstream firms are not dealing directly with the customer. That's uh, that's what I mean by upstream and um, So the, in the second part, I think I will. Uh, turn to more recent work that I've been uh, involved with that uh, deals with uh, in the situation where you have rivalry of possible competition at both upstream and downstream level. And for the sake of the explanation, I will be focusing on two by two type of situations where you have two manufacturers, let's say, and two retailers. I will, uh, uh, for the sake of explanation, I will cast the, you know, the analysis in terms of manufacturers upstream and retailers downstream. You can think of, uh, you know, you can transpose it in. Otherwise, you know, the gas suppliers and the pipeline owners would be another example. And so so the, what I, I use manufacturers in a, as, a, as a proxy for upstream firms, and I use retailers as a proxy for downstream firms. Um, in, this, uh, in this context, I mean, you know, one of the issues is the extent to which the fact that you have those interlocking relationships uh, will facilitate or not the possibility of uh, uh, reaching a nice, uh, cozy, cooperative, uh, cart de facto cartel like uh, uh, situation. That's one of the issues. The other issue is uh, uh, the, the scope for foreclosure, and in particular, uh, one issue that one concern that arises in this uh, context is what happens when uh, one of those uh, manufacturers and retailers become vertically integrated. And then the concern is that they will have an incentive to foreclose. Uh, the others, you know, to stop dealing with the others. That's, uh, that would be one of the, uh, uh, the, the focus on the, on the presentation. So let me, as I said, first part, let's, uh, as a warm up exercise, let's try to see what happens in a simple case where there is uh, a monopoly at one level. You know, uh, starting with uh, a, monopo a downstream monopoly. I start by this because that's the easiest uh, uh, configuration to, uh, to analyze. Um, so let's suppose that there is a bottleneck downstream, so the customers can have no choice, they have to deal with this uh, downstream bottleneck. The downstream bottleneck can deal with uh, several competing here, two com uh, competing uh, suppliers of the upstream level. Uh, first situation is, so there are two sub-cases here, depending on whether the bargaining power lies downstream or upstream in the bilateral negotiations. The easiest way, the easiest case is when you have a large retailer that not only monopolizes the downstream market but also has all the bargaining power when dealing with the large with the suppliers. So in that case, you, the downstream monopoly is both a monopoly vis-à-vis -vis the customers and the monopoly vis-à-vis -vis the supplier. So you have one firm in charge of everything. Uh, no wonder it will monopolize the entire industry. It will charge a monopoly price to the downstream customers and will insist on being supplied at cost by the upstream suppliers. You don't need very fancy arrangements for this, you know, a simple uh, linear wholesale price reflecting the marginal cost will do. Um, if, you know, very, uh, very easy in that case. If you have a nonlinear uh, provision cost, you may, have a, you may want to have a slightly uh, uh, more astute uh, tariff, but you know, essentially, uh, you, know, you don't need the fancy arrangements to figure out that uh, you get the monopoly outcome here and all the profits, all the monopoly profits will accrue to the downstream payer was both the monopoly and monopoly uh, uh, Interestingly, it does not matter for this uh, uh, here to make a prediction about the likely outcome, it does not matter whether the contracts, the vertical contracts are public or private. What I mean by this is it does not matter whether the contract between two given parties are observed by other parties or not. It, it, here it means that it doesn't matter whether the contract between A and the retailer, the manufacturer A and the retailer, is observed or not observed by the, man, the rival manufacturer. Uh, whether you assume that negotiations are public or, uh, uh, or, uh, or, or you know, private, 
uh, the outcome will be the monopoly outcome here. So that's uh, this is uh, this is very key. You don't need either to have a fancy contract uh, such as contracts that would be contingent on the market structure. No need for this here, regardless of you know what how sophisticated you the, the, is the class of contract that you consider. The outcome will be industry-wide monopoly. Slightly more interesting is the case where the bargaining power in the vertical uh, relations uh, lie on the upstream side. So you have two competing suppliers that are dealing with the same retailer. So if you wish, uh, if you want to use a mechanism design or principal agent uh, uh, framework, you have two competing principles that rely on the same agent in order to uh, access the customer. And there, the, uh, the lesson from the uh, literature is that you know, those uh, competing principles can use the common agent as a coordination device and avoid uh, any uh, effective rivalry between them. So there as well, even though you have competing uh, suppliers making offering contracts to, uh, to the downstream player, the outcome will be one where the industry, the, the, the customer prices will get a monopoly level. So you get again the monopoly outcome, and the uh, manufacturers will share the you know, profit with the retailer. So here, the, the, despite the fact that uh, the each, even if you assume that uh, in each bilateral relation uh, the bargaining power will lie entirely upstream. You, you can model this by assuming, for example, postulating a, a game, competition game, where the manufacturers would make take it or leave it offers to the retailer. Uh, the mere fact that there is competition among the manufacturers ensures that the retailer will get a piece of the of the pie. Uh, the manufacturer, the retailer, has always the option to say to accept one offer and say no to the other, and that typically uh, ensures that the, the retailer can uh, keep uh, some share of the, the pie. I should, I, I should have said, sorry for the, please interrupt, ask any question at any time. But it's assumed that the contracts are not conditional. So the contract for the Taiwan is for can be conditioned. So in, in, interestingly, uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of situation, uh, it doesn't matter whether the contracts are contingent or not contingent. Um, uh, Bernard and Winston have uh, analyzed this, uh, assuming that uh, manufacturers could offer contingent contracts or you know, uh, menus of contracts. Um, O'Brien and Schaeffer, in one of their papers, have done exactly the, the, same, the 97, I think, have done the same analysis, but without assuming uh, contingent contracts, get the same result. Yeah, but I think uh, the, with the fact of contingency means that I, my contract will specify what uh, I would give in this day, give conditional on what you offer. And conditional that your contract might be conditional on my contract. So, so if that happens, we can kind of agree, like so prisoners in MSH as a two manufacturers, by writing down the contract to the essentially I cooperate only if you cooperate. And that's where two manufacturers can actually form a perfect cartel. Yeah, the, so, so you, 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 may, you, you may be able to reduce the share that you need to the retailers you need. No, you, you don't need that. The, the outcome is the monopoly outcome, that's for sure. Uh, even with non contingent contract. The, the point is that the type of contract that will emerge in Kuno will be cost based contract. Uh, I will I have an incentive in order to maximize uh, the, uh, the the bilateral profits, I have an incentive as a manufacturer to offer a contract where at the margin, the marginal wholesale price reflects my marginal cost of production. Which means that at the margin, the retailer will be the risk the payment for the, the consequences of his decision. And therefore, the retailer will take the right decisions, i.e., he will charge the monopoly price. When I say monopoly price, I, mean, I should not be clear, I mean the industry wide monopoly prices. So the, the retailer will end up carrying, let's say, both <coughs> brands A and B and charging for those brands the prices PA and PB that maximizes the total industry profit. So even without any contingent contract. Um, the, uh, the, only, the only coordination failure, in the apps, uh, which you may be able to refine a bit if you allow for you know, sl more subtle contracts, is that you will have to share this industry profit with the retailer. You have to need some share of the retailer uh, if you, because the retailer could always say, you know, I take one and I 
uh, and I reject the other. And if I take only one, I will, I will generate more profit on that brand than if I take both. And therefore, in this way, you know, it cannot be the case that uh, all the profits accrue to the, 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 man, the manufacturer. That's the only coordination failure from the point of view of the manufacturer. But you get the industry wide one to your um, Now, and it does not. Uh, um, here, you do, you do need to uh, have to allow for contracts that are sufficiently general in the sense that a pure linear contract will not do. But uh, as simple contracts as non-contingent, two-part tariffs, which suffice to achieve perfect coordination. Of course, if you have uh, more sophisticated contracts, a fortiori you would achieve uh, coordination. But you don't need more uh, uh, sophisticated contracts uh, than this. Um, so that's the... This uh, does not really also it does not really matter whether the contracts are public or private here as well. Uh, you can assume that the private negotiations are private or publicly observed does not uh, does not make much difference. Um, there is a, now you could have you could have multiple equilibrium. So the sophisticated contracts may allow you to avoid generating inefficient equilibrium. But there will always exist an equilibrium with the one you can also have an exclusive dealing equilibrium in the sense that if one manufacturer, for some reason, insists on exclusivity, then it does not matter whether the other one insists on exclusivity or not. Uh, you, you, know, you will have an exclusive dealing outcome, therefore the other one is willing to insist on exclusivity or not, and therefore you can have some kind of this kind of coordination failure where both insist on exclusivity and therefore you get exclusivity. But, uh, but there exists also an, an efficient in the industry-wide cartel type of, uh, of, of outcome. Um, you can, this uh, little algebra here is also there to uh, show that it's relatively easy to uh, uh, provide some, uh, some bounds on how the industry-wide monopoly profit can be shared. Uh, the each, uh, first, you have to read, you know, each vertical pair so manufacturer A and the retailer, or manufacturer D and the retailer, each vertical pair must obtain at least what they could get on an exclusive basis. Because if they did not get this, then they could sign an exclusive deal and get rid of the other and generate this. So each vertical pair must get at least the bilateral, what I call the bilateral monopoly profit, where, you know, which they could generate by excluding the other one. Um, therefore, that puts an upper bound on the profit that the other manufacturer can obtain. It cannot obtain more than its contribution to the industry-wide monopoly profit. The difference between the total industry-wide monopoly profit with both brands A and B minus the profit, the monopoly profit that could be generated by the brand B only. That determines an upper bound on what A can get. Likewise, this the same reasoning will determine an upper bound on what B can obtain. And therefore, that gives you a lower bound on what the retailer can obtain. That's, that's where you, you know, some gain. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's where possibly uh, with some uh, extreme, you know, coordinate. manufacturer can, could try to coordinate on getting, uh, you know, beyond this problem. But, uh, um, so the, uh, you know, this, uh, and the, and the, the both papers by uh, a series of papers by Baron Wilson and, and by Brian Schaeffer show that uh, uh, exhibit an equilibrium which is efficient and where uh, the manufacturers uh, get their contributions to the monopoly profit and the retailer get uh, the, the, the revenue part. You can, uh, you can also cons construct uh, equilibria in which manufacturers get less than their contribution to monopoly profit. In, in the sense, if one manufacturer decides to be more generous, then the other one will have to match this. So in that sense, there can be also coordination failure among the manufacturers in this way. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, uh, well, here it doesn't matter whether the contracts are public or private, does, and you, know, it does, uh, the, you, you can get the same um, uh, result uh, with contracts that are contingent on the market structure or contracts that are not contingent on the market structure. When contracts that are contingent on the other contract well, then you, you may have uh, you know, an infinite uh, recursive uh, issue, so there will be some limit on that. Um, now, let's uh, turn to uh, the other type of uh, situations where there is uh, uh, 
no, there is a monopoly, there is a bottleneck at one level, which is when the bottleneck is upstream rather than downstream. So let's uh, consider a situation where you have a single uh, supplier, single manufacturer, dealing with uh, two competing uh, retailers downstream. Um, this, uh, so let's start with the, the case where you have uh, some uh, um, the upstream monopoly, so the, let's suppose that the bargaining power is upstream. You have this uh, upstream monopoly who have all the bargaining power when dealing with the downstream uh, players and, uh, uh, and the downstream players for pretty terms themselves. Now, this, uh, you can get the, uh, again, you can, you, know, you can get a monopoly, industry wide monopoly outcome. Uh, intuitively, the upstream monopoly, so uh, BMW dealing with uh, competing uh, car dealers can still maintain the monopoly outcome uh, by charging, typically by charging wholesale prices that are above cost, uh, below the monopoly level, but above <coughs> cost, so that the idea is that, you know, whatever, given whatever retail margin that can emerge in, uh, from, you know, from competition between the retailers, you, know, you have an objective, which is the monopoly price, you have some competitive retail margin, so just set the wholesale price of the uh, you know, the difference between those two, and you make sure that the retail price will be at the monopoly level. And this way, you, you know, you, you get uh, all the, uh, the you, you get your share of the, of the monopoly profit. So the, the one way to achieve this is to offer the two part tariffs with a wholesale price which is at the right level, the, the level that will generate retail prices at the monopoly level, given the expected amount of uh, retail competition, and you can use the fixed fees to recover the profit. Uh, in the, if the retailers are perfect, background type of competitors, uh, all the people will come to the manufacturer in this way. Now, that's where it's, uh, it's becoming more interesting. Here, the analysis, in order to sustain the uh, industry-wide monopoly outcome, you do need to rely on uh, some assumption that uh, contracts are somehow publicly observed. If it is not the case, so if the uh, retailer one uh, if retailer one does not observe the terms that the manufacturer is offering to retailer two, then it may be difficult for the manufacturer to maintain the industry-wide monopoly outcome. This is the so-called uh, uh, opportunism problem that has been uh, highlighted first by Hart and Tirol in their Hawkins uh, 1990 paper. Uh, there is a paper by O'Brien Schaeffer in the round in 92. There is a paper by McAfee and Schwartz in the AER in 94, which all you know, make the, the same point that in this kind of situation, when you have private negotiations, when one retailer does not really observe what the manufacturer is doing with the other uh, retailer, then there is scope for opportunistic behavior by the manufacturer, and this uh, concern, this uh, about opportunistic behavior by the manufacturer, actually backfires and prevents the manufacturer from fully exerting its market power. Um, one technical issue here is uh, the, uh, the kind of assumption that uh, you need to make when it comes to the retailer's beliefs, or the, 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 the issue is about uh, how an unexpected offer by the manufacturer is going to be interpreted by the receiving uh, retailer and therefore which will condition whether the offer will be accepted or not. So, you know, suppose for example that uh, I'm, su I, I'm, suppose that I'm trying to maintain, I'm the manufacturer, I'm trying to maintain uh, the uh, uh, industry-wide monopoly outcome for this I'm supposed to give uh, half of the monopoly quantity to Shlomo, uh, half of the uh, monopoly quantity to Natasha, and, you know, and this way they will sell the, their half uh, of the monopoly quantity at the monopoly price. I will uh, and through, and I will charge, uh, charge a nice uh, fat price uh, for this and recover you know, part of the profit and be all of the profit in this way. So if, the, if each of them believe that, then I have an incentive to go to Natasha and say, you know, Shomo is going to put half of the monopoly quantity on the market. You know what? They're supposed to, to put the other half. But given that he is going to put only half of the monopoly, there is some residual demand which we can exploit. And we know that uh, we have uh, an incentive to put more than half of the monopoly quantity on the market when in response to this half. You know? In other words, what I'm saying is that the Como duopoly outcome is more competitive than the monopoly outcome. That's what I'm saying. Yeah? Um, so, 
The, so we would have incentive to put more than half of the market into your market, and therefore this is going to depress the prices. Uh, we'll, uh, I will, we'll, we'll share the additional profit accordingly. Uh, Porsche was going to be completely uh, exploited because he was expecting to sell his uh, output at a good price, and this is not going to happen. Now, of course, Sean will be a smart, wise guy, uh, perfectly anticipates that I'm going to do this, and therefore will not be willing to pay the fat price I was asking for this uh, uh, half a million quantity. So, they're, they're, now, this reasoning uh, was presuming that when I go to Natasha and say, you know what, let's make a deal and let's uh, uh, free ride on the show. Uh, Natasha is, uh, the, 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 the reasoning was presuming that Natasha would take at face value my word when I say, no, I'm sending half a million quantity to show. But of course, you know, I have incentive to be careful in this way. And if I'm cheating on the uh, expected equilibrium, uh, by making an ex unexpected offer to Natasha, she may be concerned about the fact that you know I may be doing something uh, also sleazy. Uh, on control. So the question here is when the a retailer receives an offer which differs from the expected equilibrium offer, how should the retailer revise its beliefs uh, about the contract that is being signed with the other party? Now. For example, suppose that uh, the, the beliefs are such that any time uh, the, the retailer receives an unexpected offer, uh, the retailer assumes that the same offer has been made to the other one. <coughs> symmetric belief, which of course makes sense only if the retailers are themselves symmetric, but assume, assume this is the case. Then in that case, the equilibrium remains the equilibrium with the industry-wide monopoly outcome. Because in time I try to sell some additional quantity to Natasha, she expects that I'm doing the same with Shomo, and therefore in that case it does not pay to depart from the industry-wide monopoly outcome. So that, with this kind of belief, you can still uh, preserve the industry-wide monopoly outcome as the, an outcome, uh, despite the fact that you have private, uh, private um, uh, negotiations. If instead you take the, uh, uh, the case of passive beliefs, so whatever unexpected offer a retailer receives, the retailer sticks to the assumption that the equilibrium tariff, the equilibrium contract is being signed by the other party. Then in that case, you get an outcome which is as competitive as if you had two firms competing against each other, to each retailer being able to supply uh, the, the, the goods at cost. It's as if, in that case, the upstream manufacturer was completely schizophrenic and was uh, transforming itself into two equally capable suppliers, each one dealing with the uh, downstream, uh, different downstream retailer. So it's as if you have not one manufacturer, but uh, the retailer being integrated between, with a uh, manufacturer as equally capable as the, the manufacturer, and uh, the, the other retailer being vertically integrated with a supplier equally capable, uh, so you have the duopoly outcome in that case, you know, perfectly. You know, but, uh, if it is, if downstream competition is in Como, you get the Como duopoly. If downstream competition is in Bertrand, you get the Bertrand uh, duopoly. If the two retailers are perfect substitute, you get zero profit. Price is equal to cost. So it's pretty, uh, you know, a lot of competition, despite the fact that you have a bottleneck at the absolute level. Um, so that's the, now there are, there are various uh, uh, issues associated with this, you know, what is the right choice of, uh, uh, of belief. McAfee and Schwartz have uh, uh, to, uh, to propose to um, uh, have the, the so-called worry notion, the, they have proposed the notion, the notion of so-called worry beliefs, where uh, worry beliefs are beliefs such that when I, as a retailer, I receive an unexpected offer, I'm trying to figure out what is the best of uh, the best contract that the manufacturer, the deviant manufacturer, is making to my rival. Uh, now, of course, this is a bit more subtle than this because the best offer that the manufacturer can do to the rival depends on how the offer will be interpreted by the rival, which in turn depends on the beliefs of the, the, of the rivals about the offer that I'm receiving. So you need this kind of fixed point um, uh, you know, analysis to figure out exactly how the crew would look like. In um, um, this, uh, O'Brien and uh, Schaeffer have instead uh, proposed, relied on the notion of the contract equilibrium. Contract equilibrium is a pair of contracts here in this in case where there are only two retailers. A pair of contracts such that given the equilibrium contract in on one side, 
the other equilibrium number is the best for the point of view of the two uh, parties that are involved. Uh, you can show that the contract equilibrium is coincides with the uh, equilibrium with passive beliefs. Uh, it's the same outcome. The problem is that you, it's not clear. It could be the case that uh, the contract equilibrium is not a passive belief equilibrium in the sense that there are fewer passive belief equilibrium than contract equilibrium. A passive belief equilibrium has to resist uh, universal deviations, and that is the same as uh, characterizing contract equilibrium. Uh, but it has also to survive double-sided deviations where the main pressure would deviate on both uh, sides of the same time. This is not allowed in the notion of contract equilibrium. You only consider one-sided deviation by construction. Um, it may well be the case that uh, uh, the contract equilibrium uh, are not, uh, that do not survive the, those double-sided deviations. In a, in a note with, uh, uh, in the hand with Thibault, we showed, for example, O'Brien and Schaeffler characterized the unique candidate they, they characterize the unique contract equilibrium outcome, and therefore the only candidate for a passive equilibrium outcome, passive belief equilibrium outcome, and we show with Timo that uh, as uh, soon as the retailers are somewhat uh, close substitutes, um, this equilibrium does not survive double-sided deviation, so it's not a, a proper uh, Nash uh, or perfect equilibrium uh, with, uh, with passive belief. It's just in, your soul, uh, in the case of downstream corner competition, it can be shown that the worry beliefs uh, corresponds with passive beliefs, uh, i.e. The, the same outcome. So the, the passive beliefs outcome, which is the most tractable type of uh, you know, uh, analysis you can make here, you know, assuming that passive beliefs is uh, very tractable and very nice, uh, it turns out that in corner outcome, the, in, corner, in the case of corner competition, the worry beliefs coincide with the, 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 the passive beliefs. The idea being that once I've sold half the given quantity for Natasha, um, no, this quantity does not affect my incentive when I negotiate with Shimon. Uh, this is, I sold you some, uh, some quantity for some price, this is done, it's not going to affect you know, how much profit I can make when I deal with, uh, uh, with Shimon. So that, uh, that's the reason why those uh, you know, worry beliefs uh, boil down to a single part, the passive beliefs. Now, there's um, uh, another uh, interesting uh, situation is the case where the bottleneck is still upstream, but now the bargaining power lies downstream, i.e. you have two large retailers uh, who are competing against each other, or possibly in an imperfect way, and they, but they are dealing with the same uh, supplier. So now the, the power lies downstream, so you have, again, two competing principles dealing with a common agent, but the principles are downstream, the agent is upstream, so you have two large retailers, from, uh, competing against each other, but relying on the same supply. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, this is a, a situation that has been uh, looked at formally by uh, Leslie Mark and Jack Schaeffer in, uh, in a paper in the hand in, uh, in 2007. And they, uh, they, they make several uh, very interesting points in this, in this paper. So the, the framework is one in which you have the retailers acting as principles that may take it or leave it offers to the supplier. The supplier is free to accept both, none, or one, either, uh, no, either one of, of them. And then uh, the, 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 retailer, um, the retailers compete, I mean, at least those who, whose contract has been accepted, compete in the monthly market. The, they consider various types of uh, tariffs, uh, two-part tariffs, uh, or non-near tariffs, they introduced this notion of three part tariffs, and I want to pause for one second on this. this uh, what, what do we mean by two part tariffs? Usually we mean this. The two part tariff is a, is a tariff that has two components. There is a fixed fee, and then there is a marginal price. So if you accept the, the fixed fee is here, so if you accept the tariff, you pay me this fee, and then you know, you pay, uh, there is a variable component which is proportional to the volume uh, that you buy from. Okay? That's the, what we usually mean by two part tariffs. Um, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, Marx and Schaeffer uh, introduced the possibility of uh, fixed fees that are contingent on trade taking place or not. So one thing you can do is there, will, there is a fixed fee that is paid if you accept the contract. But there is also a fixed fee uh, that uh, will be paid only if, in the end, you decide to sell my stuff. Okay. 
So the one is unconditional on five taking place, the other one is conditional on five taking place. The reason why it may matter is that I'd, it could may well be the case that uh, at the time I sign the contract, I don't know exactly the terms of the contract or whether the other one will be active or not. Uh, I will learn that later on. And therefore, I may decide eventually to carry or not to carry the product depending on whether I'm the only one uh, to carry the product or the other one is carrying it or, or, as well. So if that's the, where it may matter whether the, the fixed fees are conditional or non-conditional on trade taking place. It's a way of conditioning it directly, indirectly on the market structure. Um, now, in particular, in this uh, setup, uh, this allows the, for the possibility that one of those fees, typically the unconditional one, being negative, hence the slotting allowances, the, those slotting fees. So this is, you, know, you can have a situation, and this is indeed what we, uh, it's, it's a pretty good approximation of what we see in practice. You have often agreements between manufacturers and retailers where first the manufacturer will accept to pay some slotting fee uh, to the retailer, and then in, after that, the retailer will carry the product, or may, actually may not you know, carry the product, and if the retailer carries the product, it will pay the, the price for the uh, that, uh, that is being transferred to the retailer. So, for example, in, um, in, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Leclerc in France, Le, Leclerc is a chain of independent supermarkets. It's a big chain. Uh, they have a common buying agency, but the stores, the supermarkets are independent. Uh, typically, you have one uh, owner that will operate, uh, that will own and operate one or two, maybe three stores. Uh, that's it. Right? So you have. Uh, so you, the, it's not the case that uh, the, all the stores are operated centrally by some kind of uh, nuclear uh, central group. That, that's not the case. They, they coordinate on buying. Uh, they coordinate on various you know, advertising campaigns and so on. Uh, but each store remains independent. Now. What, if you look at the negotiations between the nuclear and uh, the suppliers, the way it works is that the, the buying agency, uh, uh, the, the buying joint venture, will negotiate some conditions uh, for, with the manufacturer. Um, as part of those conditions, typically there will be listing fees. So basically, the manufacturers will pay to be on the catalog of uh, products that can be carried by the retail stores. And then each retail store will decide whether to carry or not. And may, on top of that, decide to find a negotiate some additional discounts and so on. So the, there are two di different decisions. You know. One is being listed on the catalog, and typically manufacturers pay for this. So that will be the, the li uh, listing fee or slotting fee, you know, the, the S that is negative here. Yeah. And then there will be some kind of a non tariff in case the, the good is actually uh, uh, distributed by the store. Meaning that manufacturer will financially pay for two separate goods, one to just to appear on the catalog, and the other one is actually paid again to retailer for yeah, the, 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 having stuff on shows. Very, very often, uh, the kind of tariff uh, that you see is they will negotiate you know, X, uh, this volume of X unit for this total price, and then this volume of X unit for this total price. That's what. So I think it's a relatively good approximation for this to have to use a nonlinear type like a two-part time. Uh, but of course, the, at this stage, this is really the price is really the, reflects the, the price that the retailer will pay for the goods. So yeah, the which way which way it will go? Because you know the story here it looks like F is positive and F is a positive payment from the retailer to manufacturer. Well, in the story of this bargaining power with retailers, F can potentially also be negative. Yeah, I even, I I, I fully agree. Um, the, at, in the end, the price has to be positive, that has to be above cost. The manufacturer needs to earn a living, so it has to be an average, average, the average price has to be above cost. Uh, the reason why I put it in this way as well it will be clear in the one moment. We, uh, Martin Schaeffer showed that this kind of tariff with a fixed fee, then a conditional fixed fee that is positive and largely positive. Uh, can, can be very uh, effective and uh, you know, play, can play uh, in, in an important role. Bear with me for one second. Um, this, uh, so this, the, 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 the key result uh, of the, the, the paper by Max, uh, Martin Schaeffer is that 
in equilibrium, you have exclusivity. So, you know, we have a situation where there is only there is a bottleneck upstream, there are two uh, high value retailers. We know that uh, if the bargaining power was lying upstream, you would have both retailers being active. You get you get the industry wide monopoly outcome if uh, contracts are public. You get some downstream competition where not only the two retailers are active, but actually they are effectively competing against each other if the contracts are, are secret. What you don't get is exclusivity, except that if, if you could contract, if you impose exclusivity, but you know otherwise, the, retail, the manufacturer will uh, either have an incentive to generate industry wide monopoly outcome and therefore have both retailers active in the industry case, otherwise, it could have an incentive to deal with each of them you know, in the same secret negotiation case. By contrast, Marx and Schaeffer show that when the, the bargaining power lies um, downstream, then in equilibrium, the, the larger uh, retailer excludes the, uh, the most effective uh, uh, retailer, excludes the other one. If they are equally effective, one excludes the other. If one is more effective, you know, would generate uh, more profit on the monopoly basis, bilateral monopoly basis, this one will exclude the other one. And certain fees will be used in equilibrium. Now, the, the way uh, the, the exclusivity arises is through the use of those three parties that, are, that were here. The idea is the, you, can, you can use one of the, uh, such a three party as a de facto exclusivity offer. The idea is to con simply consist in making this uh, fee F, the one that is here, not only positive, but, la but largely positive, equal to the profit that the retailer can expect to get if it has a monopoly position. Uh, now, if, I'm, if, the, if the retailer um, makes this offer to the manufacturer, uh, the, in this, uh, with this, if the, the manufacturer accepts the offer, it has to pay the slotting fee, so it makes a payment to the retailer. And the, the, the only way the manufacturer can hope to make a profit is if the retailer in the end decides to carry the product. If the retailer in the end decides not to carry the product, then the, the manufacturer will have will end up having paid the slotting fee and no compensating uh, revenue after that. So in other words, if I, as a retailer I make this offer to the manufacturer, if the manufacturer accepts it, then I'm sure that I will be the only one to carry the product. The, man, the manufacturer is not going to accept my offer and deal with the other one as well, because then later on I will not. You know, I, will, I will not pay this a huge fee if I'm competing, if I have to compete with the other one. Therefore, I will not carry the product. Therefore, the manufacturer will end up having to pay me a slotting fee and nothing in exchange. So, offering this kind of tariff <coughs> amounts de facto to offering a, a, an SPD contract. That's the reason why the F is not only positive, but actually large, equal to as much profit I could make if I have a monopoly position exposed on the one in question. Uh, so that's the, and the, the, so one of the nice insights of um, Marx uh, Schaeffer is precisely this point that you can use uh, apparently uh, you know, innocent uh, tariff as a de facto exclusivity uh, tariff. And the, on the other intriguing result uh, is that uh, in equilibrium only exclusivity uh, can occur. It's not possible to have both retailers being active in equilibrium. The intuition. On top of that, it's very simple. Um, consider a, a candidate equilibrium in which both retailers would be active. Um, it has to be the case the, the retailers have all the bargaining power, they make tickets or give it offers. Therefore, in equilibrium, it has to be, in such a candidate equilibrium, it has to be the case that in equilibrium, the, the, the manufacturer on the receiving side has to be indifferent between accepting both offers or either one on the, by the, on the monopoly basis. Why? If I was not, if as a manufacturer I was not indifferent between accepting both Shomo's and Natasha's offers, or only Shomo's offers, or only Natasha's offers, suppose that I'm, I strictly prefer to have, accept both offers than Shomo offers, then Shomo could ask for a bigger share of the buy. That's very simple. So in equilibrium, in a candidate equilibrium where I accept both offers, I have to be indifferent between accepting both or either one. Now, therefore, it is but the retailers, on the other hand, each retailer would be better off if the other one was out of the picture. So the manufacturer is indifferent, 
the, the retailer is not indifferent. It means that uh, from the point of view of the vertical pair between the manufacturer and the retailer, the vertical pair would be jointly better off getting rid of the other. And therefore, there is a deviation to de facto a Very simple. The argument is very simple. Um, and that, that, that was very striking. So you have a bottleneck, uh, and yet downstream competition together with bargaining power downstream prevents the emergence of an efficient industry-wide monopoly of home. When I say efficient, I mean from the point of view of the first. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not talking of from the point of view of consumers. Actually, from the point of view of consumers, the outcome that emerges in Google is even worse than the industry-wide monopoly of home. Because what you get is fewer products, and the monopoly price for those products that are uh, being offered. So we get you know, it's the worst uh, in two dimensions instead of being the worst in only one dimension. You know. um, so, so, then, uh, so that was the uh, intriguing uh, reason. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Marx and Schaeffer argue that you need the three part tariffs uh, and therefore you need the floating fees, negative payments, in order to uh, have this equilibrium. Uh, that is not true. Uh, you can achieve de facto exclusivity uh, with tariffs that are everywhere above cost. Uh, the a very simple way to do so, to replicate the de facto exclusivity offer, it consists in offering a contract that says, I'm willing to supply this quantity at cost. So if you accept this and you only buy in this range, then I will make no, no money. Uh, but if you want to have more than that, then you have to pay me some, uh, some fees. Uh, this, uh, uh, again, if I offer this contract and this contract is accepted by the manufacturer, I can design the, the, you know, how much I'm willing to buy, at, uh, willing to sell at cost, so as to make sure that uh, I'm indifferent between uh, that, that uh, quantity at cost or the, you know, more and the monopoly, the industrial monopoly outcome with, uh, you know, paying fee, sharing the profit with the manufacturer. I'm indifferent if the other one is not there. Um, but I'm no longer indifferent if the other one's there. And in that case, I will buy only the, you know, the small quantity at cost, and therefore the manufacturer will make no profit. So if the manufacturer accepts this contract, it has no incentive to accept the other contract because it would make no profit from my contract. So in this way, you replicate the, the de facto exclusive offer. If this con contract like this, which is everywhere above cost, um, at cost or above cost, this contract uh, achieves the same uh, you know, has the same uh, effect as a de facto exclusive offer without in, in, including, without uh, involving any negative payment, actually without in, involving any below cost uh, price. Here. So you don't need certain fees, you don't need listed fees, you don't need negative payments in order to uh, uh, achieve de facto exclusivity. That's, uh, that's what I'm saying. Um, now, in, in, a, in the first paper, uh, um, uh, for building on uh, uh, the paper by Marx and Schaeffer with uh, uh, Janine and Thibault, we uh, made the observation that if you allow for contingent contracts, contracts that are contingent on market structure, so if you allow uh, the retailers to offer not one contract, but two contracts, one for exclusivity and one for non-exclusivity, then you restore the existence of an industry-wide of an efficient industry-wide uh, monopoly outcome where both retailers are active and, and share the, 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 uh, the industry-wide monopoly profit with the manufacturer. You can make the same kind of algebra as I did before to show that the manufacturer will have to keep a share of the industry-wide monopoly profit. Um, but, and there is a, uh, there is a uh, you can exhibit an equilibrium in which uh, each retailer will obtain its full contribution to the industry wide uh, uh, profit. So, that, so interestingly, well, if you allow, uh, the, uh, you can interpret this as saying that if you allow the retailers to condition to contract on exclusivity, then you restore the existence of a non-exclusive equilibrium. Whereas if you don't allow for this kind of uh, uh, explicit uh, uh, contingency, uh, then you, the only equilibrium is an exclusive equilibrium. Now, in, uh, in, uh, with my Winston in the follow-up paper, we show that uh, the key aspect is not whether you can contract explicitly on exclusivity or not. The key question is whether you restrict attention to contracts that, are, that involve a single tariff or whether you allow for menus of contracts, menus of options. 
So we're, we're basically we replicated. Uh, we, we show that you can achieve the same industry-wide uh, monopoly outcome, the efficient outcome where both retailers are active. Uh, if you simply allow the retailers to offer two options, two tariffs, uh, one that is designed for exclusivity and one that is designed for non-exclusivity. And you can use uh, the, you know, the, the, the kind of tariffs that I mentioned. That I, you know, the, there is one with de facto exclusivity, which there is no exclusivity uh, uh, written in the contract, but de facto it, uh, it will be used as an exclusivity offer. And you can design an option for the for the exclusivity that replicates uh, the, um, uh, what we have done uh, before with uh, uh, with uh, Tibo and Jenny. So what what, it, what matters here when you have uh, this uh, situation with a bottleneck upstream but bargaining power downstream? The, the key issue is the type of contract, the class of contract that you uh, that you allow, and particular whether you allow uh, for offering menus of options or whether you impose uh, the, 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 the the principles. I mean, the retailers here. Um, um, you impose, you know, still mentioned, you impose them to offer a single option. Um, in, a, in a related paper, Austin Mildred showed that uh, you, you can also replicate, you can restore the existence of an efficient equilibrium if you allow for, uh, instead of for fully allowing for contingent contract, you allow for uh, renegotiation in case uh, the market structure turns out to be different from the one you had in mind when you negotiated the contract. Uh, she uses a kind of a, the stone zebel type of uh, multilateral negotiation uh, framework where uh, you have first bilateral negotiation, then a second bilateral negotiation, then a third and so on, until, you, and until all the bilateral negotiations have taken place. But if one of those bilateral negotiations uh, uh, you know, does not uh, succeed, then you take this pair out and you start all the negotiations from scratch again. That's the kind of uh, uh, situation, you know, the kind of framework they are, they are using. And she shows basically that you restore the existence of, a, of a, uh, an efficient equilibrium. So in, in, in a sense, you can view uh, the, uh, the, off, uh, the, the, off, the, uh, the offering, uh, uh, a, a, interpreting contract as a menu of options can be seen as a shortcut for you know, offer, uh, for the outcome of a negotiation that will be contingent on market structure. That's, that's the moral of the, the story. Um, let me uh, skip this because I see that the clock is ticking, uh, even though if it is uh, <laughs> taking into account that. We show that uh, in, uh, with uh, Mike and uh, we show that this uh, extends to any number of retailers, any uh, or in pretty, uh, pretty general principle. Now let me uh, uh, turn to the, uh, the second uh, part of the... This was the warm-up, huh? I remember. So let me turn to the second part of the, uh, the, presentation, uh, the presentation, which is really on this kind of uh, interlocking relationship. We had uh, the first paper with Thibault, uh, which, which had a great idea. Uh, it was a great idea. It was the idea that when you have this kind of uh, multilateral uh, interlocking relationships, then competition is not obvious. Uh, the competition doesn't work uh, the way we usually tend to think it works, and it's very fragile. It's very really easy to get to kill any competition. That was the general uh, idea. Um, in particular, this, uh, you know. What is the, the simplest, uh, 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 suppose you have this kind of situation, you have two manufacturers, two retailers, and I ask you, make a prediction about the likely outcome. So the, the way we go uh, uh, at uh, answering this kind of question in modern IO is we usually uh, superpose uh, the rules of uh, some kind of competition game. Uh, so the fundamentals is here, you have the cost, you have the demand, and so on, these are the fundamentals. And in order to make a prediction about the likely outcome, we superimpose on those fundamentals some competition game. So I'm asking you, what kind of competition game would you consider in order to, as a plausible in this context? Bertrand, yes, so? Yes, so what kind of, you know, you need to, 
determine uh, what are the uh, plays, uh, the moves, or the more flavor. And what I've done you know, so far is exactly to cover you know, the, a battery of uh, standard uh, models for the simpler market structure. So, building on this, you have one very natural one is uh, the manufacturers are going to make uh, offers, or they are going to offer tariffs to the retailers, the retailers uh, uh, observe the tariffs, decide yes, no, and so on, and then complete. You, know? you can uh, do it in various ways. I'm going to focus with, uh, with Thibault, we started with what we thought was the simplest possible framework. Uh, manuf each manufacturer, A and B, is going to offer a contract to uh, each of the retailers. Um, the retailers and you can offer different contracts to the two retailers. Each retailer observes to make it very simple and avoid any kind of uh, suppliers opportunism. The retailers observe all the contracts that are on the table and then decide to say yes or no to each of the offers uh, they receive. And then the retailers, at least those who have accept, uh, accepted the contract, at least one contract, will set the prices for the products for which, uh, which they accepted to come. And in order to make it, uh, to avoid double machination issues, we allow for two bar tariffs, not simple linear wholesale tariff, but two bar tariffs, and but no more complicated than the bar tariff. That's what we focus on. Yes. One thing here is that uh, the original conditions for uh, so you might easily have a, you easily have a situation where core here is empty, mm -hmm. meaning any group of any group of three can uh, beat up. You know, you won't be able to, so if you consider a perfect cartel out of four, a group of three, you, you, you don't find any way to divide the, the money. And then there's an issue of uh, what, in principle, no matter how you model competition, what might be your solution for the game here, because you consider it. And if you have divisions, you might, and you, you might just have a, a situation where you don't have a solution. So, I agree. That, that's the whole point. What I'm, uh, you know, we, we don't have a very good and tractable framework for dealing with this kind of multilateral uh, uh, situations. Yeah. On top of that, we need to allow for the, 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 the difficulty uh, compared with uh, you know, standard cooperative games where we look for you know, the core or whatever. Uh, here we want to endogenize uh, the, uh, the arrangements between the parties. We, so we want to allow for you know, on top of that, we want them to you know, negotiate uh, time. So, the, so the, 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 the set of possible payoffs expands uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, but you're right, this kind of issue uh, uh, arises, and actually uh, it will uh, arise in a particular way in one, in one moment here. Now, before getting there, the, what kind could you expect the outcome to be competitive, to be uh, assume an equilibrium exists? Uh, forget those existence problem here. Would you uh, expect the equilibrium to be competitive, to be uh, to have uh, retail prices uh, below the monopoly level, uh, below cost, above cost, above the monopoly level? What would be your bet? You have competition upstream. You have competition upstream. You know, it's something to say. You have some kind of competitive outcome. In particular, suppose that there is product differentiation both upstream, the brands are differentiated, and downstream, the retailers, the stores are, you know, they are not exactly the same place. So you have both upstream differentiation, downstream differentiation. You would expect that you know you have four relevant products: A1, A2, B1, B2. Uh, they are imperfectly competitive. You would expect some that the outcome would be the outcome, the competitive outcome with you no know, differentiated products, four differentiated products. This is not the right way to look at it, because it's not, it's not as if you have four firms with four differentiated products. Uh, the, the outcome would be less competi competitive than that. In particular, the one thing to realize is that when A negotiates with one, um, they will, of course, internalize the full margin generated by the sales of brand A at store one. But manufacturer A will also care about the impact of this negotiation on the upstream margin that A will make on the sales of its brand at store two. And if they negotiate a franchise fee, you know, this franchise fee will depend on also on how much retailer one will make on the downstream margin of the sales of one. 
So de facto, there will be sensitive and there will internalize the impact of their decisions on the whole margin on the sales of A at 1, the downstream margin of the sales of B at 1, and the upstream margin of the sales of A at 2. This is the Uh, this is the green part. And of course, when A is with 2, it will also do the same. So in the end, A will internalize the impact of this negotiation on all the green stuff, the green margin. The only thing that is missing, the only thing that will be ignored is the impact of these decisions on the upstream margins of the rival ones, the ones that are in red here. So in particular, in Think of a candidate equilibrium in which wholesale prices will be at cost and all the, pro the share of the profits that goes to manufacturing will, be, uh, will go through the fixed fees. Then there will be no upstream margins and therefore you know, the manufacturer will have incentive to induce retail prices that are at the monopoly level, industry-wide monopoly level. Now, this is not an equilibrium. Because in order to sustain retail prices at a monopoly level, despite retail competition, you need wholesale prices above cost. And therefore, but then you know, each manufacturer will have an incentive to free ride on the rivals' upstream margins. Therefore, that's the reason why the equilibrium is somewhat competitive. But as you can see, it's slightly more subtle than you know, the way we, use, we tend to analyze uh, one stage, one level type of competition. So, what, uh, so first uh, point that we, we made in this paper was that, yes, you would have a somewhat competitive outcome, but it's, you know, the analysis is a bit more involved than what you may think, uh, and it's not, it's, it's not necessarily highly competitive. Now, the only the, the, the problem we encountered and the reason why um, we uh, did not uh, finish the paper in six months, but uh, in about 12 years, Um, and attended up in a journal of industry review, and this, even though we had a great hopes at the beginning, is the, 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 the fact that actually those uh, equilibria often fail to exist. Uh, the, um, and the reason is that, as in the Marx and Schaeffer framework, in any candidate equilibrium in which all four channels would be active, it has to be the case that the retailers here on the receiving side have to be indifferent between accepting to carry both ones or either one. Therefore, it's very easy by, by perturbing even on this slightly uh, given contract, it's very easy to break that indifference. And therefore, by slightly uh, perturbing the contract between A and 1, I can induce 2 to stop carrying B, for example. Anyway, any slight perturbation can, can uh, trigger a continuation equilibrium where the market structure is different from the equilibrium market structure. You have the four channels, if one can be open or, or, or shut down, that is 2 to the power 4 equals 16 type of market uh, configurations. It's just a mess, it's just a nightmare. To, and the, 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 the negative uh, result uh, that I'm mentioning, the inexistence of an uh, uh, equilibrium where all four channels will be active, uh, relied on the most ugly proof I've ever been involved, even though I was remotely involved, and I must confess Thibault did all the hard work on this one. Uh, it basically relies on uh, 50 pages on mathematical printout that uh, checks all the possible you know, deviations and find that there is one that, uh, that works. There uh, were no deviations triggering a different market structure. Um, so so this, this is not very nice. This is clearly not tractable. Uh, this, and of course, the, the proof is only for the, the very specific case with the linear demands, the simplest one I could think of, and so on. So we have to. But uh, for the linear demand, you know, standard, you know, most simple one, uh, for half of the region uh, of the parameter space, there is no uh, And we have no idea uh, what, whether there is an equilibrium in those regimes. And we are, if so, we have no idea what it looks like. And it's really, it's really nice. Uh, the great idea of that paper, however, was the idea that if you introduce recent price maintenance in this uh, framework, then you restore the existence of an equilibrium in which all prices are at the industry-wide monopoly outcome. Uh, so despite the fact that you have competition both upstream and downstream, if, even consider allowing for purely bilateral vertical resale price maintenance contracts, so resale price maintenance, maintenance is a provision that says that the retail price is determined by the upstream manufacturer rather than by the downstream retailer. So if you allow A, when negotiating with one, to specify not only a wholesale price, WA1, a fixed fee, FA1, but also the retail price, R, P, A1 for one A in store one, 
you have stopped the existence of equilibrium in which all, of all prices are the molecule level. And the solution is very simple. If you can negotiate for the retail price, then you don't need the wholesale price to hide the retail price. So we can, I, and actually, when you know, I negotiate with, uh, and I, uh, I don't care about, once I fix the retail price for my brand investor, the wholesale price is just a way to share the profit on this channel, but I can use the fixed fee as well. So I don't really care about the wholesale price for any wholesale price. If I change the wholesale price, I can adjust the fixed fees to uh, implement the same sharing uh, rule. So I don't really care about the wholesale price of my product in this store. But that wholesale price will determine my behavior when I negotiate with Shoma. And therefore, you know, give me any profile of wholesale prices, I can construct an equilibrium around it. And in particular, you know, with wholesale prices, of course, the retail prices will be at the moment. So that's, uh, uh, that, that was, a, we thought it was a great idea. Uh, the problem is that there as well, in existence becomes an issue. Uh, the, you have the same uh, feature as before, and therefore, you know, very difficult to make a prediction when the liquid will, will exist, uh, and so because of those deviations to alternative market structures, which is a bit related to your um, Now, we know, uh, the, so in the meantime, we work on the paper by Max Schaeffer, and then, therefore, we know that in the context of Max Schaeffer, if you allow uh, to have menus of options, uh, or options that are contingent from market structure, you restore the existence of an efficient equilibrium. And therefore, our conjecture is that if you allow for you know, the manufacturer to offer uh, menus of options that are either specifically contingent on the market structure, and I think we, we have uh, convinced ourselves that if you allow each manufacturer to offer a menu of 16 options or 15 relevant options, you restore the existence of the equilibrium and you get the monopoly outcome. Uh, the question is, you know, what, what happens when you restrict somewhat the number of uh, options that are, uh, that are uh, uh, So that's one way to go. Another way uh, to go is to uh, 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 see uh, in this context what happens when you consider and set secret contracting. And this is what I've been doing uh, in, uh, at, the uh, at the moment with uh, 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 Thibaut Berger, Assuming, considering the case of Bertrand competition uh, downstream, and with Volker Moke considering the case of uh, Como uh, competition downstream. So the, 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 the paper with uh, the work in progress with the Thibault uh, considers the same situation as here, uh, two manufacturers upstream to the to the retailers downstream. But now the manufacturers offer you know the negotiations are secret. So manufacturer A offers the contract to R1, offers a contract to R2. R1 only observes the contract that A offers to it, does not observe the contract that A offers to B. It also observes the contract received from B, but does not observe the contract that B is offering to B. Uh, to make it very extreme, uh, acceptance decisions are not observed either before the downstream competition is taken. So R1 receives an offer by, from A, receives an offer from B, has to decide whether to accept it or not, and then has to set the price for those products that it has tested to carry, not knowing yet whether, you know, not knowing what are the terms that were offered to two, and not knowing whether two is carry, going to carry A, B, both, and so on. Um, and in that, uh, in that case, uh, we show it's very, uh, so there is this question again about what is the right, what are the right beliefs, uh, how retailers are going to interpret unexpected out of equilibrium offers. Um, we know from O'Brien and Schaeffer that uh, the notion of contract equilibrium is quite convenient <coughs> and quite tractable in the setup, so that's what we are doing here, uh, which means that uh, somehow we, we do uh, consider that the manufacturers are a bit schizophrenic when the right, uh, left hand uh, negotiates with one retailer and ignores what the right hand is uh, doing with the other retailer so that we don't allow for double-sided deviation, basically, that's what I mean. Uh, but it's tractable, you know, and after 12 years of, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, the, of uh, hard work with the other one, we, we are uh, willing to trade you know, tractability against, you know, a bit of uh, um, not so clean type of uh, 
Um, now, it, it is very tractable, it's very convenient, very simple. Um, there exists in the absence of uh, recent price measurements, and here we don't need to make any restrictions on the type of contract. You know, it can be any nonlinear tariff. We don't have to restrict to two-part tariff. Uh, we don't have to, you know, any nonlinear tariff is observed, is, is acceptable. We do restrict attention to tariffs, so we don't allow um, one contract to be contingent on what happens to the other one. Uh, so we cannot make a, an offer that is contingent on what on the offer we make to the other one. We also, this uh, rules out kind of market sharing contract, where the payment that one will make to A will depend on the market share of one on A's products, for example, exports, so, because this would be an indirect way of contracting on what happens to the other, and that would introduce an element of horizontal contract, which typically enterprise authorities are you know, fighting, and you know, this would be legal. Uh, so we are holding up the, the, this possibility. We are focusing on purely vertical uh, contracts, you know, non, any non-linear tariff uh, with, uh, with people. Uh, and there, there always exists an equilibrium. Uh, there is a unique equilibrium bond com in which uh, both manufacturers offer both uh, retailers cost-based tariffs. Well, by cost-based tariffs, I mean that the marginal wholesale prices reflect the marginal cost of production and there could be payments for fixed fees or elsewhere so to share the profits, but the marginal wholesale price will reflect the marginal cost of production, and therefore the, the, the equilibrium will be one as if the, the retailers, the retailer, the situation is the same as if you had a duopoly between R1 and R2, except that it's a duopoly where both firms are multi-product firms. So you have a duopolistic du competition between two firms that each carry A and B yeah, uh, with a cost-based contract. It's as if uh, R1 could supply for itself A and B at cost and it w is competing against R2 which can supply for itself R A and B at cost. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very competitive outcome uh, in that sense. Um, this, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, simple, that's very nice. And the, yeah. And uh, finally, what we find is that in the setup, as you know, our great idea of the first paper uh, is still there, but uh, this time in a much simpler, much more tractable framework, despite the fact that you have secret contracting here, and therefore the scope for positive behavior also, uh, there, you see, when you allow for recent price maintenance, or when you allow the, for the bilateral vertical contracts that uh, stipulate retail prices as well as uh, wholesale price, uh, you restore the existence of an equilibrium in which all the prices are the monopoly level. So that's what I mean when you have this kind of interlocking relationship, uh, competition is for job. Uh, it does not take much, uh, you know, a bit of sophistication in the vertical contracts like RPM, for example, adding RPM suffices to eliminate any competition both upstream and downstream. So RPM does not only eliminate intra-brand competition among the retailers, uh, but also in the bank competition among the manufacturers. And finally, I see that Shomo is uh, getting away. Uh, the one word on the, uh, on the uh, uh, ongoing work with uh, Volker Noke. So here we are more interested on what is the impact of vertical integration. Uh, for, and for this, what we are doing is uh, we are we use a framework that is a bit simpler than the one we use with uh, Thibault, uh, where that's, we, we consider the case of common competition because we know from the literature on, on circuit contracting with uh, upstream bottlenecks that the common competition downstream is easier to deal with than the Bertrand competition downstream. In particular, in that case, passive release and working release coincide, so that's, that's nice. So we use this uh, framework. And what we look at is you know, what is the impact of vertical integration in, so like this. You know? So in the absence of vertical integration with common competition, you have a duopoly outcome where here, for, to make it simple also, we assume that uh, the retailers are perfectly homogeneous, but they compete à la corneau, so it's another way to introduce downstream competition with, while limiting the number of uh, you know, complexity elements of complexity. Uh, so the brands A and B are differentiated, but the retailers are perfectly homogeneous. So what you get uh, with vertical separation, the outcome is one, it's as if you have the duopoly between one and two, Corno duopoly, if you want to, except that each duopolist uh, competes with both brands A and B. Um, so you have a relatively competitive outcome. If uh, both firms are vertically integrated, 
then we show that each firm will stop in equilibrium. The only equilibrium outcome is one in which each manufacturer supplies its own subsidiary and but does not supply the uh, rifle downstream firm. In equilibrium, it could do so, but it chooses not to do so. So you get a geopoly outcome, but between single product firms instead of a geopoly outcome between multi product firms. So you have less competition. You have only one firm carrying A competing against one firm carrying B and only B. And finally, we look at a Yeah, so, so this, uh, the, um, so this was supposed to not be here, that's what I mean. And finally we have the, the, the case where there is vertical integration on one side and not on the other side. Um, and uh, we, uh, that's what we're, we are working on, but uh, we find that there exists an equilibrium in which the integrated manufacturer stops supplying the other one. We, have the, we know that the vertically separated uh, manufacturer will keep offering uh, we keep supplying both uh, downstream players with cost-based contracts where the marginal uh, offset prices reflect marginal cost. Therefore, you get some kind of hybrid uh, situation where you have a dual product outcome between a, a two product firm competing against a single product firm, <coughs> which is a kind of uh, intermediate lies uh, somewhere between the two extreme cases. So, in this setup, each vertical integration results in two foreclosures. The integrated manufacturer will stop supplying the downstream competitor. Uh, and if you have two vertical mergers, it's even worse than if you have a single vertical merger. And that's, so that's the, the moral for the moment uh, that we have. And I should stop there. Okay. Exclusive dealing, so the vertical integration could probably be completely contractual, right? And in that sense, it is not clear what what dif differentiates the slides with vertical integration, with slides where uh, these parties just dealt with each other through contracts. Yeah, the, the, thanks for this. The, um, uh, so interestingly, this uh, uh, hybrid case where you have uh, so. Suppose that uh, uh, A is vertically integrated with R1 and B remains vertically independent from 1 or 2. Uh, in equilibrium, A will choose to stop supplying uh, 2. Uh, so it's as if there was de facto exclusivity between A and 1. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, you could replicate this with exclusive dealing contract in two ways. One way would be to say that uh, A enters into an exclusive supply agreement with one. Mm -hmm. So A commits itself to not deal with R1's rival. Alternatively, you could have the same situation with an exclusive dealing contract from R, an exclusive distribution agreement by two, whereby two commits itself to carry only one round, which is one B. So that, which I think is interesting because the implications for, from the point of the strategic standpoint, depending on whether you achieve this with a distribution exclusivity or a supply exclusivity, may be completely different. You know, when it comes to discussing you know, stability, core, whatever, you know, the fact that you, you achieve the, the same situation in two different ways may uh, uh, restore the scope for existence of the uh, uh, So, so that, that's one uh, aspect. Uh, but the second, uh, the second comment I want to make is, yes, here, Exclusive uh, vertical integration leads to de facto exclusivity. Um, so there is no point blocking such a vertical merger if you allow for exclusivity contract. Actually, it's even worse. 
um, the fact that uh, uh, vertical integration here leads to complete foreclosure of the downstream driver is related to the fact that we are assuming that the two downstream drivers are perfect substitute. If R1 and R2 were differentiated, then following the vertical integration between A and R1, the vertical merger between those two, A will have an incentive to reduce its supply to R2 in order to reduce competition, downstream competition, but it would not it would still uh, benefit from dealing with uh, R2 to the extent that R2 may have some niche customers that it is the only one to be able to uh, access in a reasonable way and so on. So you will not have complete exclusivity. And therefore, in this situation, if you were to block the vertical merger but allow for exclusivity, then the, the firms would resort to the second best, uh, which from this, this standpoint would be to try to replicate or approximate this result with an exclusivity agreement, but this agreement would be even worse for customers or efficiency or for society as a well. whole. Uh, so, yes, uh, the, from the, uh, the, the lesson from this from the antitrust uh, perspective is that, you know, when you, when you intervene, uh, you must have a kind of a consistent uh, view and enforcement uh, uh, you know, approach. Uh, there is no point uh, fighting one if you let the other uh, the other solution uh, uh, open, particularly when it's a second best, not only from the point of view of firm, but also from the point of view of consumers uh, or society. Thank you. Thank you. Sergei asked about you know, having a word from the contract. I think here you can potentially have a very interesting dynamic interplay where you know, your games that you considered before this was that uh, you, know, you considered this contract that you disagree simultaneously in the conditions what happens if you delete? But you know, instead, you know, these two guys can say, look, we don't have agreements from all the parties. We just decide whether we want to sign, uh, when we want to make a vertical merger. And the moment we make a vertical merger, we don't know what's going to happen later. But it might be optimal for us to do it and commit ourselves to essentially getting together. And then after that, there's all the whole situation. So, you know, this, this changes the nature of the game might actually work to the favor of this uh, Absolutely. You're perfectly right, and uh, uh, this is something that we, we still need to, to work on. Uh, for the moment, we, the only thing we know is that uh, uh, you know, one market structure is more profitable than the other. Uh, we can, the, uh, in the case of vertical separation, we can pin down uh, the uh, equilibrium profits uh, not only the aggregate equilibrium profits, which have been what, which is what I've been uh, referring to so, so far, but also how the profits will be shared between the upstream and downstream firms. Actually, here uh, it's not the case that there is a unique equilibrium outcome when when it comes to the uh, uh, how the profits are shared. There is an equilibrium outcome in terms of retail prices and quantities, so in terms of total industry profit, therefore, and total consumer surplus, and so on. Uh, but the way the, the profits will be shared between the upstream and downstream firm is indeterminate. We, we exhibited uh, a continuum of equilibria which uh, differ in how the, uh, the, the profit uh, is shared between the upstream and downstream levels. We are not saying that these are the only equilibria, but uh, we already have exhibited a continuum of uh, ways of sharing. We, uh, uh, we, 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 try, uh, we have some argument that uh, suggests that one equilibria would be uh, one one equilibrium outcome would be uh, selected by uh, some kind of uh, of human refinement, but uh, uh, no, we know that there is. Uh, we also know that in the case where you have uh, a vertical integration on both sides, then then there will be, we, we can completely pin down the uh, profits that uh, the, the two integrated firms are going to to achieve. So that's uh, that's very easy. They need to achieve. Uh, they're, 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 we don't have any ambiguity there. Uh, in the, in the hybrid case, uh, where one, uh, if, uh, one, firm is, uh, one supplier is vertically integrated, the other one is not, uh, we, we, we know for sure that there are zillions of equilibria, uh, which, so, which is a bit problematic when it comes to try to determine, uh, to study the dynamics. You know, suppose that what is the incentive to form a merger given you know, the impact it will have on the other's incentive to merge or not to merge. Uh, 
and, well, and the impact that uh, not merging would have on the others in sensing to merge or not merge. And so you could, you could have a situation where each one free wise on the other and would opt that the other one could merge or other than the other. So that we, need to, uh, we need to work on this. The fact that uh, we, have a, uh, we, not, we don't have a, a single determination characterization of the ways the profits are shared between the upstream and non-stream firms in case of separation is a bit of a problem for this, but that's, the, that's what we are working on at the moment. But indeed, we are trying to figure out which um, uh, situation is likely to emerge uh, if you, you know, model sequential uh, opportunities to merge or not to merge or to enter the exclusive beam or not to enter the exclusive beam. The fact, in the case of exclusive beam, whether it's the exclusive distribution as we supply, you probably need to uh, uh, different uh, uh, results. Um, that, 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 is, uh, that is an interesting question. We suspect that in a, in a merger again, you will get uh, bilateral vertical mergers. Um, uh, but uh, still need to, to uh, double check that this would be the case for, you know, for all possible ways on which the profits could be shared in case of separation. In the case of exclusive uh, uh, distribution of skill supply, I think the, the game is, is going to be. Uh, it's not clear that you, you get um, uh, the double exclusive. There's a question. Uh, you mentioned this double common agency equilibrium. Yeah. Is there any literature on the more and more general setting? It's difficult to get characterization in existence. Uh, Absolutely. The, the, no, I mean, again, the starting point of all this was that we, we don't have a proper um, uh, you know, general framework for this kind of. Uh, multiple uh, common agency situations and, and so on. But is anybody uh, there, 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 there are some, uh, you know, you have double, to, double. Well, the, the double common agency in which everyone deals with everyone, um, a, no, with, without, uh, um, no, in, a, in a most of our way, we don't, I don't think we have, I'd be happy to, yeah, you know, we, we are looking for, uh, for this. Uh, we are doing the, all this power because we didn't find anything when the other ship. If there are no other questions, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you.